Good evening, everybody. It's good to see everybody in the house. Are you excited to worship? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I just wanted to stir ourselves up a little bit. Um, I got, uh, uh, I had a, uh, uh, a very good friend of ours, her name's Carol, give me this book. It says, Time to Advance. And I wanted to just read a couple things out of it. I just wanted to encourage you on, on what our worship is for, why we are worshiping. Uh, and, and some people, you know, are concerned about what does it look like, right? Well, I want to give you some ideas. So the word Judah represents praise, and it comes from the Hebrew word yada, and it means to lift up hands in praise, to give thanks, acknowledge God's works. Isn't that what we're doing? We're acknowledging what He did in our lives, Right? Uh, there's another a Hebrew word that is, uh, I, I'm not sure, I might be butchering the pronouncements, but that's okay. Uh, we'll get over it. Uh, uh, tada, or, or toda, to extend the hand and to thank, to give a thank offering and to praise His goodness, right? Isn't that awesome? I mean, that's what we do. We're here to praise Him, to extend our hands and to give Him praise. It's not to look at your neighbor and wonder what they're doing, but it's to Him, our Father. The next one is Barak. These are different Hebrew words that are translated praise, thanks, thanksgiving. Uh, uh, come in, uh, in Psalms 100 talking about coming into His presence with praise, right? You can look these up. Uh, another word is Barak, to kneel down, bow, greet, or bless, right? And then we got the word ruah. I want you to hear this. To hurt or split the ear. If you wondered why we have worship music loud, here's your answer. <laughs> to hurt or split the ear with sound. To make an ear-splitting noise to God. To shout. Make a joyful noise. Trumpet blast. Isn't that amazing? I think God knew. He knew contemporary worship was here to stay when in contemporary worship was, uh, was in its beginning stages, right? Another, another Hebrew word is uh, teruah, and it also means to split the ear, an alarm, signal, sound of tempest, shout of joy. And, and I want just to address this. You might be like, well, that's not really my style, right? How many know their styles? I remember going to... Um, a concert, and they had a Christian rap, and I didn't really think that was my style. Anybody listen to Christian rap? And in fact, I, before I went, I was just like, oh, that's not even, I don't even know if that's music. I don't even know if that's Christian music. And then I listen to this Christian rap, and I get to know these guys, and how they walk in power, and how they walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, and what testimony they were to the community they were reaching, and I kind of got to liken it. And I repented for my attitude and my understanding because I didn't understand what was going on. And they reached a cer certain group of people that I probably may never, I, I may never reach them, but they are. And, you know, I found out I just had a little bit of a critical spirit. <laughs> so we just cast that out and move forward, right? To split the ear, an alarm, signal, sound of tempest, shout for joy. There's a bunch more. Here, let me keep... Um, there's, there's the word hala, to praise God in free, unrestrained celebration, to make a show, to be clamorously foolish. Anybody want to be foolish tonight? Here's your chance. <laughs> Here's your chance. You get 30 minutes of the, the opportunity to be foolish before the Lord, right? And it's not about the person beside you, the person, what they're thinking or looking at. It's between you and your Heavenly Father. And so I'm encouraging to step into this. It's called radical praise. And maybe it wasn't the way you were brought up. Maybe it wasn't the way uh, you normally do things. But it's okay. It's okay. You can bear 30 minutes once a week to get a little bit radical. You know, uh, maybe, maybe you're like, well, I'm not, I don't do that in my house or my church. Well, that's, you're no longer in your house. You're no longer, uh, if you're not part of this church, if you're new here, you're not part of those other churches. You're part of this church, and it's allowed. 
And I just want to give you permission. Amen? Glory to God. Worship Him, worship Him, praise Him. Thank you, Jesus. If there's anybody here tonight that uh, would like a fresh infilling of the Spirit of God, tonight's your chance. I know this can happen in, in the, in the uh, corner of your own room and your house, but the sad part is it doesn't. So God knew that. That's why He had us come together corporately. And if you want something that just rejuvenate you, that's what the Holy Spirit is for. He is here to give you power. He's here to give you power to live over the circumstances, not under, not to be beat up, spit out, and chewed up. But He's, he's here so that you can have victory in your life. And if you haven't been having victory... If you have if been bucking up against the wall, if you've been coming up against things in your life, maybe it's the outside of your box that you have around you subconsciously, and you just can't have, you aren't seeing the breakthrough that you need, then this altar calls for you. This altar calls for you. And you can be filled with the power of the Spirit of God. So that you can be doing the exploits and the things you are to be doing on this earth. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for this young lady. And I just ask that you baptize her in your spirit to a greater degree. That there is more. There is more where uh, she's already tapped into some of it, but there's more there for her. And I just thank you that it is here, it is available, and she's willing to receive in Jesus' name. Father, fill her up completely till her cup runs over in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank You for this man and the anointing and the calling that You have on his life that You fill him up with Your power. The power to, to uh, reach people. The power to uh, extend hands so that Jesus will touch different people that other people may never reach. But this man will. And Father, I just thank You that it is already there and he can tap into it in the mighty name of Jesus. Fill them up. Heal them, Lord. Heal them. Heal them in Jesus' name. Jesus' name, because that's what the Spirit of the Lord does. He gives you power to do what He's asked you to do. We have no time to be sick in Jesus' name. Are you in line? And uh, Father, we thank You and praise You for this young man and the calling that You have. Father, I just ask that You fill him up uh, with a fresh anointing of, of uh, Your Spirit. And Father, that Your Spirit can give him, uh, even at nine years old, that he can have the power to walk on this earth, that he can have the power to walk in authority in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank You. I thank You for the willingness and the understanding of receiving Your Spirit uh, in a fresh way. And Father, I just ask that You give it. Uh, just pour it out upon her in Jesus' name. Just pour it out in abounding, abundant uh, ways. Just like You said in Psalms 23, that her cup overflows. And Father, we thank You for Your overflowing cup by Your Spirit in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank You. I thank You for this young man and some of the commitments he's already made for You that he's, uh, he's set apart his life. He said, I will serve You, Lord. That's what he said. That's what he said, Father. And, and you're not going to ask something of him that, he's, that he does not have the power to participate in. So, Father, I just ask that You give him the power of, uh, of the Holy Spirit complete full all the way to the top in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank You for Your anointing. I thank You that Your Holy Spirit is alive. I thank You that Your Holy Spirit is available for all. And Father, I thank You for this young lady as she, as she desires to be filled fresh, fresh, fresh 
in Jesus' name. A fresh anointing. A fresh anointing. Glory to God. It's available. It's available to everyone that receives. It's available to everyone that receives. Say, I receive. I receive your spirit, Lord. I receive your power to live life in all things that pertain to life and godliness. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for this young lady and, and the calling that you have for her. And Father, this time that she is birthing, she's going through a phase that she will birth a life. And Father, that you give her the power by your Holy Spirit in a new and fresh way. That it doesn't have to be uh, drudgery. It doesn't have to be dragging on. It doesn't have to be something that she's just got to go through. But that she can live in victory. She can live with the power of the Holy Spirit working inside of her to a greater and greater degree. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Is Jesus your Lord, young man? Jesus is your Lord. Father, I thank you that he's already said he believes that you've died on the cross for him and that he's your Lord, uh, that, that you are his Lord. And I, Father, I just, I just, maybe the infilling of the Holy Spirit is new, but it's okay. And Father, I just ask that you touch him in a way that he has never experienced Jesus before. And that the Holy Spirit comes into his life, is one with his spirit, and he's filled. He's filled in Jesus' name. And he has power to live life. He has power to rule and reign in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Say, I receive. I receive in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. You know, the locusts have come. The locusts have come, and they have taken. The canker worm has come. It's eaten, and it's taken, and it's taken. But the Lord says <laughs> that He can make straight the paths of your feet, and He can put you back. He can put you back where you've been, and he can restore what the canker worm has eaten. And he can restore what the locust has taken. And you can live a life of victory uh, in, as a mighty man of God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for this young lady. And that she has many years ahead of her. And Father, that the Holy Spirit gives her power. Power! In all things, in all things, in all things, in all things, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, I thank you for your power, the power of the Holy Spirit. It's here, it's available for all that will receive it, all that will be filled, and Father, this man uh, as he has uh, attempted things in business that haven't always worked out. But Father, you've given him the power by your Holy Spirit. You have given him the power that, that people will begin to look at him for wisdom and understanding. That people will begin to see that the anointing of God is on his life. The anointing of God is on his family, on his business to such a degree that people marvel. And they say, what is this? And you will have an opportunity to say, it is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not by me, but by Jesus who rules and reigns in me. And because of that, I rule and reign in this world. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for the calling and the anointing and the humility that this young man is walking out. And Father, I thank you that, that his heart is in a place to receive greater and greater things. And Father, that you will, it's only begun. It is only begun. It's only begun. It's only begun. It's only begun. It's only begun. And the Lord says He can't give it all to you right now because you don't have the ability to receive it. But if you follow me and stay filled with my Spirit, I will then give you the ability to receive more than most people will even have, uh, e even think about. 
And Father, I thank you for his heart that is expanding as we speak expanding to receive your love even more in your the, to receive your spirit even more to a greater degree that he walks in power with these hands thank you lord thank you father thank you lord father the holy spirit is here the holy spirit is available to all and she's made a declaration of receiving more because she knows she hasn't tapped into it fully yet. But it is available. And Father, I ask that you show her how to tap in 100% that the Spirit of God is so manifested in her life that people will also look and say, how does she do it? How is she doing this? It's because of the Spirit inside of me. It is power that you've given us by the infilling of your Holy Spirit. Fill her up, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. This young man, oh, thank you, Father, that your Spirit knows no bounds, has no age limits, has no age limits, but it goes beyond what we can think as human beings. It goes beyond what we can comprehend, but it can even, even the young people, even this young man can shout Jesus from the rooftop and be filled by your Spirit to the overflow, to the overflow, that it touches His family around Him. That it touches people around Him. That He is then a testament of your living Spirit. Jesus, You are alive. Fill Him up in Jesus' name. Thank You, Father. Thank You, Father. Father, fill her up with Your Spirit. Oh, thank you, Jesus. There's a preciousness about you, young lady. But you must, you must endeavor to open your heart to Him, Jesus, on a daily basis. You need to say and speak with your mouth, My heart is open to your Holy Spirit, Lord. Fill me. Fill me. Come inside of me. Change me. Create something new in me that I become more like Jesus. Become more like Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Young lady, it's time for your word. It's okay. The lion is roaring, and he's going to and fro through the land. He's coming for your children. He's coming in many forms against them, but I have given you them as, your, as a gift and a blessing from me, but I see one thing that you have not done. I have given you a mandate in Ezekiel 33, and you're to speak blessing over your children that they would hear the sound of the so shofar, that their ears would be opened, and that they would listen to the watchman and the prophet in these last days it's important for you to pray a blessings over your children they're coming and they're going so that they will hear my voice clearly and they will take heed of it So what do we do? We're going to be obedient. We're going to talk. We're going to speak to our children. We're going to speak blessing over them. We're going to prepare them. We're going to raise them up. That's what our job is, parents. Our job as parents is to raise up our children in obedience to Jesus. And they're going to watch how you walk in obedience. And so if you don't like how you're walking, then you need to change so your children can walk and run and not faint 
So it's about you, parents, and it's about how you are raising your children. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give them some glory. Give them praise. Thank you, Father. Some ear-splitting sound. Glory! It's too late to be bashful. If you're bashful, you need to get your nose in the carpet and repent. You can you sing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach Jesus from the rooftop. How many have sung that? How many have sung that? So are you willing to preach Jesus from the rooftop? Amen. We got a couple. Yeah, it's literal. You're going to be a light that's set up on a hill. You're not going to be in the basement hiding. You're going to be set on the hill. And you're ass to share Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. Are we done? I'm looking at you, Lee. I'm not sure you didn't look like you were finished. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I remember Sydney and myself and uh, I think it was John. Is there anybody else with us? We went up on the mesa and on one of the lookouts over the valley, we just shouted Jesus over this valley. We shouted Jesus, a great exercise. I mean, there's nobody to, I mean, if you're embarrassed, go there, shout Jesus, right? Practice, practice. <laughs> and it was a great exercise. We just shout Jesus and you listen to the echoes and you listen to it ring Amen. Because Jesus, there's coming a day, and it's not far from now, that every knee will bow. And it's better if they bow now. Okay? It's better for them if they bow now. And guess who gets them or guides them and leads them to be able to bow? That's you. <laughs> right? You know, it wasn't my idea. Uh, it was his idea. So if you don't like what I'm telling you now, then you just take your beef with God. He'll hear you out, right? And, and you, you, you can argue with him, well, I don't know if I like this idea. Well, uh, it was his idea that the, the, uh, the message is preached, right? It was his idea that the name of Jesus is preached to everyone, amen? And so uh, we are the message carrier, Amen? We carry that message wherever we go in Jesus' name. Well, one way we love God is how? By loving one another. You think we started that, Jimmy? I heard that. You remembered that, didn't you? You remembered that. <laughs> Glory to God. Well, shake somebody's hand. Say, welcome to Church of the Word. We're glad you're here tonight. Tonight, we're having church. Amen? Amen? Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Church of the Word. Isn't God good? <laughs> hey, welcome. Welcome to Church of the Word. If you can be seated, that'd be great. So I just wanted to share what, when I was in the prayer room, it was just, I just had to think, he makes the impossible possible. Aren't you glad we serve a God of the impossible? Because in Luke 18, 27, it says, But he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. So I just wanted to encourage anybody who's facing an impossible situation, you need to get your praise on, because God is a God of the possible. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> uh, that's good news. So... I'll go over the announcements. Monday prayer is canceled um, due to the 4th of July holiday. Then we will have Tuesday evening Bible study here at 730. All are welcome. And then there is no youth group tomorrow evening like usual. Instead, we will have a youth conference this Thursday and Friday. Thursday evening, the youth will meet at 7 o'clock at Pastor Jay and Kim's house to learn to know Josh and Alicia Schumann and their family. And then Friday, they'll, they'll discuss Friday plans Thursday evening. Friday, and just so parents know that Friday they will be leaving Delta around 8.30 or 9 o'clock. 
the, the youth need a packed lunch, a Bible, a notebook and pen, and a water bottle. And then they will be back after supper around 8 o'clock or so. So Kim will be sharing updates, more information on the Youth Voxer group. So just pay attention to that this week. Well, hallelujah. Good to see everybody here tonight. Praise God. It's good to be back in Colorado. <laughs> we went to Missouri last weekend. and We got to Kansas partway through and stopped at a rest area, just had rain and walked out, and it was like, just that humidity. I, I mean, that, there's uh, pros and cons to having a moisture, to have a humidity too, there's a lot of green over there, but, and here there's not, but I like the dry. So, I guess we're ready to, are y'all ready to give an offering? <laughs> so we will receive it I will, I will not say we'll take it I'll say we'll receive it praise God so um, I'm going to Philippians I'm trying to find it That's kind of Philippians 4 <clears throat> I like that scripture I mean I know I use it a lot but I don't think we can wear it out <laughs> Philippians 4. I don't know why, I just feel like I ought to say something else before I start, but I don't know what, so. <laughs> I guess I'm going to start. I'm going to start in verse 10. It starts off, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that once again you renewed your care for me. You were, in fact, concerned about me, but lacked the opportunity to show it. So here they were like, they lacked the opportunity. They wanted to to give to Paul, but they lacked the opportunity. So if you've been lacking opportunity, which we usually don't give you reason to lack opportunity, but <laughs> so here's your opportunity. <laughs> Praise God. I guess the one thing I should say is, does anybody need an offering envelope? If you do, raise your hand. I'll have Sheldon run it to you. Um, and verse 11 goes on. I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. So Paul didn't have a need. That's just... You know, some, in some settings, uh, if they wouldn't have a need, maybe they wouldn't give an opportunity to, for people to tithe and give offerings. But he wasn't doing that because he had a need, which he goes on to explain why here. I know both how to have a little, and I know how to have a lot. So, do any of y'all know how to do that? You know, that's, yeah, I'm getting to learn to do, do them, I guess I should say. In any of all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content. I mean, that's the secret right there. There's a part of being content and, and not having little or even having a lot. Because there's, we have to, we're tested in having abundance, too. So, and what we do with it and how it controls our lives. Because this was just a conversation, off-handed conversation me and Curtis were having this week. I just got thinking, what would I do with if I'd hit the, the Powerball? You know, 300 million or whatever it is. I'm not sure. I saw some numbers at a gas station, you know. I'm just like, I wonder how that would affect my life, if that would, how that would impact me. But all of a sudden... The big old pal. Of, yeah, anyway. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Anyway. Then verse 13 goes on. I'm able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we should be able to do all things. And then verse 14. Still, you did well by sharing me with me in my hardships. And you Philistines, Philippi, not Philistines, wow, Philippians, <laughs> Know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. They were in partnership with him. And I want to be in partnership with this church and with God in my giving. That's why I tithe. Verse 16, for even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts to my need several times. Not that I seek the gift. And right here is why he was talking about earlier. You know, he didn't, after. Because of a need, he wasn't after him. 
Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit. Not to himself. He wasn't a seeking a profit for himself. He was seeking it for them. That increasing to your account. So he was in, that's what his, he's after, and that's what I'm after too, is that when you're, and you're giving, because the Bible says that if you give, it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It doesn't stop at the, the rattle, clang, 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 clang. It doesn't stop at the, at the top, scraping off the top of the barrel. God keeps giving. You know, if we get Dorito chips, we, you know, they're big and full here in Colorado. It's all filled up. And we open them, poof, and then it's about half full. You know, if God would be filling those bags, it would have warning signs on them. Warning, extreme danger, safety glasses needed. <laughs> open them and chips all over the kitchen. Anyway. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> so anyway, Paul's desire is that your accounts would flourish. But I have received everything in full, and I have an abundance. I am fully supplied, having received from Epiditus what you provided, a fragrant offering and acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. So there were some smelly givers, I like to say. But also... It was an acceptable offering. Sometimes their offerings might not be acceptable. I'm not sure exactly how that all looks, but I want my offering to be acceptable to God. Verse 19, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And that's, of course, a good fridge hanger that we all probably have. But My God will supply your needs. Your needs, according to his riches and glory in Christ. Now this is just kind of a side note. It, it doesn't say here to pray for your needs. And if you're a giver and walking with God, born again, loving God, he's going to take care of your needs. If, you know, if we go into Mark 4 and, or Mark 11 talking about praying for things, it's, it's praying for your desires, not your needs. Because God's promise, that's a promise you can stand on, that he's taking care of your needs. He wants you to pray for your wants and your desires. You know, some people, that might scare some people, but it reveals to ourselves also what's our desires. Right. If they don't line up with the word, well, then we, we need to check our hearts. <laughs> so, praise God. So if you are ready to give your offering, we will receive it. <laughs> praise God. Curtis, you want to pass a bucket? And then if you all would stand up, I'd like to offer our tithes and offerings and worship to the Lord. Then verse 20, I'd like to finish here. It says, Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Let's give God some glory tonight with our tithes and offerings. We worship you, Father. We glorify you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Pray you'd bless this offering and these tithes, Lord, that they would go forth and produce what you want, that harvest, abundant harvest, Father, and that you would bless it back abundantly to the giver, Father, that there'd be plenty of bread in his storehouse and plenty of more seed to sow. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that his presence is before us in all things? in our giving, in our receiving. Thank you for sharing that, Lee. You know, uh, that is uh, one, of the, one of the reasons we teach on giving every week is so it benefits your account. Uh, you know, that's rejoicing material. That's rejoicing material that, that uh, we benefit. It's, it's for the people that are willing to tap in to the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is based on sowing and reaping. You cannot get away from it. You cannot disengage from it because the way you live your life and the way you operate in your life is on the principle of sowing and reaping. There is only that, that, that is the greatest principle. And if you're willing to tap into it, even on a financial level, it will go above and beyond what you can ask or think in the natural. 
I am living proof of it, aren't we? There was a time we barely had two nickels to rub together. But those days are long gone in Jesus' name. Now we have accounts. <laughs> and we got one named the God account. I don't know what the bankers think when you go in there and say, you know what, I want to set up a new bank account and we want to call it the God account. That's what it's for. It's to put money back so that we're not caught in a service with no money. Anybody been caught in a service with no money? We've probably all been there. And you can put money back. And then when the Lord deals with you to give, I learned it from a, uh, from a friend of mine. He just may happen to be sitting in this service. <laughs> and, and then when the Lord deals with you, you're available and ready to go. And it's so freeing to be able to do that because I love blessing others. Amen. Well, before we get into the service, I do want to honor and bless Sydney. Pastor Sydney Ropp is with us uh, tonight. He's not going to be preaching. However, I'm blessed that you're here uh, uh, just gracing us with your presence. For some of you that don't know, Pastor Sydney actually started this church. Uh, back in 2009, and he pastored it for two years, and then God called him to go serve with and under Pastor Dale Armstrong in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So then uh, uh, Pastor Sidney and his wife Jen moved to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and now actually pastor our, what we call our sister church, or really the church, uh, uh, we're one in one way, but we're uh, under in another way uh, from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, it's called CWI Lancaster. So um, Church of the Word International from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So we're just honored to have you. So glad to just have you in this, uh, in this service. I have learned many things from Pastor Sidney, and I count him as a father to me in many ways. Um, there was a time in my life, even though Pastor Sidney is six months younger than me, he's also a father to me. So figure that one out, right? He's my father in the faith, but he's six months younger than me. I actually forget about it. I kind of think he's older than me. And then every now and then I'm like, oh, I'm actually older than you, brother. <laughs> uh, but we've had many things God has shown us, has brought us uh, so far. Uh, I, I count it uh, a privilege uh, that he did not um, uh, give up praying for me. Uh, there was a time that uh, we were not even, we were great friends at one point in our life. Then we came to a point in our life where we were not such great friends. And uh, because of praying and, and pressing in on some things, uh, he knew that uh, he gave, actually, he was the one that gave me the drug problem, and then I got deliverance from it. Uh, and when, the reason I say that is because he drugged me to church one night. And uh, uh, so he, he ended up dragging me to a weekend meeting that I did not want to go to. And of course, I had a lot of lies that I was believing. And I believed that, that uh, I was kind of, you know, forced to go kind of because, you know, I knew that Sydney would ask me some questions and I'd have to answer. Again, just mind games with the enemy. And so finally I agreed to go and because and, uh, I kind of wanted to just pay him off and shut him up. And it changed my life. And so I, I, uh, Kim and I went forward in the altar call, and I, I met a man, uh, uh, Pastor Dale Armstrong, had no idea I was going to serve with and under Pastor Dale either, and uh, he so confidently prayed for me, and I just decided that night I want to be able to pray like he does. Because I had prayed hundreds of prayers, and I, I knew God wasn't answering my prayers. And I wanted a personal relationship with the Father so that I could hear him, and he prayed so confidently. And, and so through that, uh, the, this church was born from that weekend, and Pastor Sidney was then uh, ordained as pastor several months later, and uh, here we are uh, since, see, 2009, 2022, what is, what is that, 11 years, uh, 12, 13 years later, can I do math? I think it's, you know, it, it may, maybe it's Common Core, hopefully not. Uh, Thirteen years later, uh, we're in a place that w I didn't know we were going to get to just by being obedient in an altar call. Amen? See, those things we don't always, can't always measure. How, what, uh, what ripples 
those things make. You ever uh, skip rocks on a pond? You ever play that and try to skip two or three times? Uh, maybe you can get four or five times, and some of you that are full of faith can maybe get seven or eight times, right? And, uh, and, then, and, and it makes ripples, and 15 minutes later, you see the ripples hit the other end of the bank, and it's because of that one rock. Well, some of the, some of the same principles apply for us that there's things that we're guided or the Holy Spirit leads us and we don't understand the magnitude of it but it ends up rippling and affecting people that we didn't know I mean you all wouldn't be here if I would have refused to go I don't I mean, maybe the Lord would have had another way to get my attention he probably did uh, but you know if I would have rejected his call for my life we would not be here tonight right so th th there's ramifications for decisions we make. Amen? There's ramifications on, on different things that we are led, and as we're obedient, there's ram ramifications for it. So thank you, Sydney, for being a father to me, and I really appreciate it. So before we get into the sermon tonight, I want to just talk about a few things. And um, we, uh, we purchased this building about a year ago, or a little over a year ago now, um, and there's a testimony behind that. I'm not going to go into it, uh, but we were able to purchase this building, and uh, this last week I was blessed because we had a few people that wanted to serve, and so they were painted a, a few things, and so I just realized kind of that I haven't updated people where we're at in a long time, and I probably should. <laughs> so we've had projects, and we probably had so many projects that a lot of you, you know, sometimes, and even myself, you kind of get to a place of you're a little bit weary of all the projects and things not ever being done. But I'm here to tell you that we are closer than we've ever been. <laughs> Tonight, right now, we're closer to having this building complete than we've ever been before. And, and we are even closer than maybe you think. Uh, we do have people in the schedule. I was able to contract the, uh, the duct work and, and the uh, HVAC system for that side of the building, and we actually have a date, and they're arriving the week of July the 13th, I believe it's a Tuesday, and they, they want to finish that side of the building so that we have air conditioning, thank you Jesus for Bible study, <laughs> and because, uh, you know, it kind of gets hot in there. Um, and uh, so we're just very happy that, that that's going to happen. And then in August, we already have a schedule um, uh, with a drywaller to come in and finish all the drywall in that side of the building and bring it to a place of being able to paint it. So that, that is to happen in August. Now, we had, uh, we had kind of taken over payments from the previous... Uh, um, building owners, and we're very thankful for, for the price that we got it for, and then uh, I had shared this before, and this is just to update some of the new people. Then uh, uh, we went back, and, and we had, we asked the bank for an additional uh, extension of funds to, to finish some of the things that, that we needed to finish uh, to complete the building. Well, um, as you're quite aware of, I believe, with current events, uh, there's some things, your dollar doesn't seem to go as far as it did a year ago, does it? And uh, so the money that we, we went back and, and to the bank for, we still are well within, the building's worth about double of what we have in it currently. So thank you, Jesus, for that. Uh, but, you know, the funds aren't going to finish the entire building. So uh, I just want to let you know that uh, if you ever want to designate any funds to the building fund, uh, we, we do have a fund for that so that we can continue. And we really, I believe, by next spring, I would like to have the place landscaped by next spring, and I really believe we'll be finished. We already have, uh, again, the, the HVAC systems paid for, uh, uh, the, the uh, drywall uh, is paid for, the roof is paid for, right? It's just, it's not finished yet, but it's paid for. So I'm really happy for, like, a lot of the materials are bought and waiting and s until the appropriate time. Uh, shingles, you, you kind of want to do it when it's not so hot, right? And uh, so we just kind of push that up off to later this, this uh, uh, for the fall. So then uh, by next spring, we'd like to have the whole outside finished, and I really would like to get it landscaped uh, uh, by next year. So 
just a quick update, and then we're flexible. You know, if we fill every single seat in this building and we have standing room only and people are falling out of windows, uh, we probably wouldn't have to raise them from the dead falling out of these windows, but uh, when that happens, uh, then, you know, we, we're ready and in a place to maybe uh, look for a different building, uh, and I do believe that's already on my heart that, that at some point this building will be too small. It's just going to be too small. You know, Lee and I sat uh, or stood in the back there, uh, oh, what was that, two years ago? And we just started, it just come out of our spirit, and we started declaring and decreeing that every seat is filled in Jesus' name and that there's going to be such an abundance of people in this building that, we're, that we have an overflow. And, then, you know, if we've got to have two services on a Sunday, glory to God, we'll have two services on a weekend, right? If we've got to have a Saturday night and a, and a Sunday service, that's, you know, we're not putting anything outside the bounds of what God wants. I'm actually watching a church in a war-torn country in Odessa by Pastor Vitali. Pastor Vitali is the one that I've been working with very closely on the Ten Men Project. And uh, they just went to a two-service Sunday because their church is overflowing with people in the middle of a war-torn country. The Spirit of God is moving in that church. There's people getting set free. And, and it was to the point where a lot of people had left. Now some people have come back. And they have also been such a testimony to their city. And a lot of it is because of, of money you've given, of money that was raised that we took over there. And we've put them in a place uh, that even the city officials are looking at them and going, wow, you guys really get things done and you care for the poor. It's amazing. And then they come to church to check it out, right? And, and i just seen pictures tomorrow uh, is their first service that they're going to have uh, two services on a Sunday because they're too full. So glory to God. That can happen here, amen? That can happen here. And if we need three services on a weekend, we'll go to three. If, if we uh, start doing what Joe Yonji Cho uh, did for his church in, in South Korea, uh, they were only allowed to attend service once every six weeks because they had so many people. So you were only allowed to come to services once every six weeks so that they could get everybody into the service. I guess that would be okay too, Lee, right? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. So, uh, glory to God. The other thing uh, I also wanted just to update everybody, I am planning another trip. Uh, we will be leaving August, uh, August the 2nd and, or 3rd, depending on ticket. We have not purchased the tickets yet, but we're looking at tickets right now. We'd like to purchase them very soon. I was just asked here recently again, what does the 10 Men Project do? So we, bring t we take 10 men to uh, the country of Ukraine. They, they are, um, it's up to them to raise $10,000 so that we can actually show up in a war-torn country. We believe this is one of the best ways to do it. We take in medical kits and the cash, okay? And we're there to empower the Ukrainian church and Ukrainian pastors. And the government of Ukraine is on notice. They're going, the quickest, best way to get things done is to use pastors to do that. You know, the quickest and best way to get people out of Mariupol before Mariupol fell was for pastors to drive in there with their vehicle, right? And to rest and to fill it up and take people out. They knew how to get through the checkpoints. They knew how, what roads to use. And they were getting in and out when the government could not. Okay? That's the power of the Ukrainian Pastor Network. I call it the Ukrainian Pastor Express. I can show up, if they would find out that I show up at the, at the ferry, I could be in Odessa in less than four hours because there's people that would come get me and express me to where I need to be. I can be on the front line of the war in six hours because there's people that would come, if that's where I'd want to go and say that's where, where I need to go, they would pick me up and take me there. Right, And so these are, these are just things that we've been able to empower them as the church in America is empowering the church in the Ukraine for the pastors to do, be the hands and feet of Jesus in, in a time of war. That's what we're doing. 
That's what the 10 Men Project is for. That's what it's about. And there's lives that were saved. There's medicines that were given. Uh, there's hospitals that were begging for medicine that we were able to provide. There was kits that went to the front line. You, you, we had soldiers thanking us, saying thank you, because we don't even have any pain medication. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know if you would look forward to getting shot and you already know there's no pain medication. And so when they seen our bottles of ibuprofen, they cried and said, thank you, because at least we have something. At least we have something to give out. And, and these, are, these are just things, uh, things that the 10-man project has already done. The food has gone into different villages. It doesn't matter if the village was bombed or blown apart or not. They were, have been affected by the war. People have lost their jobs. There is, there is no, uh, you know, the job they may have had uh, it doesn't exist anymore, right? And so be able to show up and preach the gospel to them, the good news of the gospel, and give them food means a lot to these people, right? That's what the Ten Men Project is doing. And when the ten men go over there and they preach the gospel and hand out these things, um, it's, it's a huge win, I believe, for the country. Uh, really what we're in is a war, what we call... It's the war of attrition right now between Russia and Ukraine. It's whoever loses the most is the winner or the loser. There's, really, there's no winners in war. How many know that? And so whoever loses the most, the quickest, withdraws, right, or surrenders. And, and so one of the ways that we can help keep the Ukraini Ukrainian spirit alive and people wanting to, uh, to continue to defend their country, I believe they have a right to defend their country, and I'm not going to get into that, but they do have the right to do that, uh, given by God. And uh, they, they are able, it's, it's, it's the will of the Ukrainians versus the power of the Russian army. And so whoever loses the most in that scenario gives up the quickest, right? And, and uh, going over there, inspiring them with food, medicine, the gospel makes a difference. Amen? So I'm going to be leaving... Uh, in August, and I'll, pro I'll actually be gone two weekends. I was hoping not to be gone two weekends, but I am going to be gone two weekends because I'm also going to join um, Pastor Sidney in, in the country of Turkey, and we're going to be able to be, uh, be part of Larry Mills Holy Spirit Conference the very first day. So I'll be part of that uh, at least the first day, maybe, the sec maybe also another day before I return. So I already have some children looking at me, wishing they could go along, and uh, they would be, um, you raise $10,000, I will take you. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. So, let's open our Bibles to Proverbs. We have, I've been enjoying this series, and I'm going to be in Proverbs chapter 4 tonight. We've been talking about not leaning to our own understanding, and uh, I'm going to shift it uh, uh, just a little bit. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to look here in Proverbs chapter 4, and uh, we're also going to go to uh, Mark uh, chapter 4 about the sower, or possibly the account in Matthew. How many know that leaning to your own understanding is going to get you into trouble? Well, we got one, maybe two people that understand that. How about the rest of you? How many know that leaning to your own understanding not might get you into trouble, will get you into trouble? It will get you into trouble. You have to understand that. You have to get to the point that your understanding is not the thing you lean on. See, there is an understanding you lean on, but it's not yours. And you have to learn to understand the difference between the understanding that God gives us and the understanding that your brain is telling you. See, the five senses that you're told in science class on how the body operates, what are the five sen senses? Somebody name them off to me. What are the five senses? Seeing, hearing, feeling, smelling, tasting. See, what that does that now will lead your body. Do you understand that? Now, I want to just ask you this question, and maybe this will answer some questions for you. Should you be body-led or spirit-led? So the natural man is led how? 
by his body, which is a, his soul is, is, is influencing his body, right? The spiritual man is led how? By the spirit. Do the spirit and the body agree on all things? No. So there's a war that happens the second you wake up. Because when you wake up, what do you do? What's the first thing you do when you wake up? Probably. Or very close to the first thing. You open your eyes. Some of you rub them. Right? Some of them are like, I can't see the coffee. I don't know where the coffee is. Oh, there it is. And you're looking for the cup. And I'm so thankful for the Church of the Word coffee cups because I get to the bottom of the coffee and it says expect miracles down there. So I'm telling you, get a cup. <laughs> expect miracles. You finish your coffee in the morning and you set yourself up to expect some miracles. Amen? So that's why coffee is a good thing because it gets you in line with the Spirit. <laughs> Oops. Maybe that's not a Bible verse. So one of the first things you do when you get up is you begin to, um, uh, you are going to then fight the natural versus the spiritual, and this will happen all day to you. So you open your eyes, you begin to see, you look, and you may make a mistake of uh, grabbing your phone and you start looking at headlines of the day. Now I'm telling you right now, you might as well stop and not do that. Because I've done it. <laughs> and I'm telling you from experience, it's not good for your soul. So, I mean, you can immediately, and within three minutes, you're going, oh my goodness. Well, I don't know. I think the economy is going to crash. Real estate's going to crash. The stock market is crashing. Crypto has crashed. Like, what is there that's not crashing? Right? And, and so you need to grab yourself by the ear and say, I'm no longer going to keep looking at these certain things. But see, God knew that when He made you, He knew that even in your fallen state of, not fallen as in wicked or fallen as in, um, but, but even as your body having lost, uh, see, the redemption of the body is not going to happen till later. You're not going to receive your glorification in your body till later, right? It's not happened yet, so you're still in the fallen state as far as your body goes. That's why your body is not to lead you, okay? But God knew that that was going to happen, so He gave you His love letter, okay? He gave you a love letter that you can open your eyes and you can begin to read what He's saying. Amen? You can begin to read what he's saying and it's going to change something in your head. See, now you may know that the, 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 in the natural that those headlines exist, but you begin to read and you might open your Bible to Deuteronomy 28 and you realize that in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 15, it doesn't say uh, dependent on the world's economy uh, is whether you're blessed in the city or not. That's not what it says, is it? It says you're blessed. It says you're the head and you're not the tail, right? It says that you're above and you're not beneath and it's not dependent on whether the Dow Jones is at 40,000 or 35,000. It's not dependent on your 401k, whether it has decreased by 30%. It's not dependent on whether your crypto account has been locked and frozen and you can no longer tap into what you thought you had, right? It's not dependent on any of that. It's not dependent on anything the world has their store of wealth in. It's dependent on what he said. So that means that the economy that God is operating on, you can tap into by your spirit. And you can say, you know what? God said in Philippians 4.19 that uh, he said it this way. Paul, uh, Paul's saying it. He's saying, my God will supply your need. And it's not according to the world's economy, but it's according to his riches in glory. And let me tell you, he walks the streets that have the gold. He's got pearls that are so big that they make gates out of it. That's God's economy. God's economy made the earth, made everything in the earth, 
made the gold in the earth, and he says, it is good. God's economy is, is going to... T- it, he says that your left hand, your right hand, you're walking in and out, and everywhere you go, that's the blessing of the Lord. The anointing of the Lord goes with you, and it's not dependent on the world system. But do you see how the world system can affect your everyday life? The world system can affect because you're taking it in by your understanding, by your, you see it, you understand it. A lot of you are very smart math, uh, in math. Some of you may not. Some of you may understand Common Core. Some may not. <laughs> right? So... <laughs> You may be able to do numbers. You may be able to sharpen your pencil. You may be able to budget. You may be able to do all these things. But are you leaning to the world system and how they operate? Or are you saying, yeah, you know what? Whether lumber prices go up or down, I'm blessed. Whether gold and silver prices are a hedge against inflation, I'm blessed. You know, the law of sowing and reaping is an effect, and I'm going to live by it. And I'm going to live by that law, and I have been sowing. And so God's economy, which is why we teach on giving every week, God's economy operates on the basis of sowing and reaping. Not what the Dow Jones says. Not what the realtor says your house is worth or not worth, right? It's the law is in effect and it's up to you to put it in effect. It's up to you to put it in effect. Proverbs chapter 4. Let's go there. Let's read. Let's read the word. Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 3 is where we were the last several weeks. Uh, verse 5 and 6 especially. Last week I went through all the way to verse, I believe, verse 12. Verse 13 in Proverbs chapter 3 is just a, is, is a good. Read the rest of this chapter. There's so many good verses in there. Proverbs chapter 4. In verse 5 it says, Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. The, the, the understood person is who? It's the Lord, right? So you get understanding from heaven. Say, I get understanding from heaven. I get wisdom from heaven. I don't lean to my own understanding. Verse 20 says it this way, My son, daughters also, give attention to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. Now, i seen something this afternoon. I didn't, some people, maybe I'm just, I think maybe sometimes I'm way behind the eight ball, right? For some reason, I, maybe I don't get it as fast as you do. Uh, that's okay. Thank you, Jesus. I got it this afternoon. Amen? So it's saying, my son, uh, give attention to my words. Now, now, see, a lot of times I give attention to his words like this. Hmm. Hmm. Boy, that's good. Mm. Yeah, that's good. I'm gonna keep reading, and then we'll go off. Wow, this morning was just amazing. It's just great. But that's not what he's telling you to do. How do you incline your ear to his sayings if you're not hearing anything? How are you obedient to the second part of that verse if your mouth is zipped shut? How are you doing what he's saying? He's saying, my son, give attention to my words. How do you give attention to his words? Not by reading silently. See, in Ephesians it talks about going out and, and, and putting on the armor of God. How many are familiar with that? And then at the very end, it talks about the sword of the Lord. What, what's it talk about? It says, saying. See, the sword of the Lord does not and cannot become a sword till it's coming out of your mouth. 
then it's the sword. But it's not the sword of the Lord in your thinking. Now, you are going to renew your mind in your thinking. I get that. But my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Now, I've read that verse I don't know how many times and never thought about it that it's about what I'm saying. Incline my ear to my sayings. So if somebody is saying something, I need to incline my ear to it, right? And this does not say, my son, give attention to my words. The pastor will tell you the verses and he'll talk about it in his sermon and I'll listen. That's not what it says, does it? See, something, somebody with a heartbeat has to be saying something so that you can incline your ear to it. And I'm telling you tonight, it's you. It's you. Incline your ear to my sayings. Well, who's saying it? You are. So read your Bible out loud. Oh man, I, I, you know, this, this word business, this stuff that, you know, this, this, this stuff, it's not working for me. It just did. You know, I, you know I've been trying to, I, you know, I, I'm so frustrated. You know, I've been trying and I've been trying and I've been trying and it's just not working. You know what? The people that, I, that come complaining to me about the word not working and I ask them, have you been saying it? Oh. No. Do I, well, that's work. Yes, it's work. You might have to write some of these verses up on your, the dashboard of your truck when you drive down the road in your car, you look at it. It might be on the, on the mirror so that when you finally get the sleep rubbed out of your eyes and you stumble over to the bathroom that you get to see some verses written in the mirror that God says about you. And you find the verses you're having problems with. For example, you know, I just, I don't know, it just seems sometimes like I got a hard heart. Well then find verses that'll soften them up. I got one for you. My word is like a hammer. Start saying that over your life. God's word is like a hammer and He can break hard rocks, including you. Find the verse that applies to your life and apply it. Say it. Incline your ears to the saying. See, you can't incline your ear to nothing. How many know that people shoot at nothing and hit it every time? That defines most Christians. They, what, what, what are you believing for? And, and, well, nothing. Well, guess what you're going to have? Nothing. Right? What are you believing? And, and don't just, well, I'm believing. Believing what? What verse are you talking about when you say, I'm believing? What verse is it? Well, I don't know. I don't know. You better have one. You better have the saying so that you can incline it. And I'm telling you, if you do this, blessed is the man that does what? Hears and what else? And does these things. Amen? Remember the wise man and the foolish man? You know, we kind of have a little silly children's song about that and ring around the rosy and all fall flat and... Whatever, however we sing it, and we kind of laugh and giggle, and everybody thinks it's funny, but it's actually the destruction of a man's life. Right? So you read it, the wise men and the foolish men built their house where? One did on the, the foolish man put it on the sand, the wise man put it on the rock. But see, they both were building their house before the storm. And I, 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 I can't get this into you enough that you've got to get things right before the storm. I don't know about you, but uh, you can take any general storm and you can probably get two or three two-by-fours nailed together out there in the middle of it, couldn't you? I mean, especially if you've got Lee's skills 
and Mari's skills, you might be able to even get a little wee little piece of plywood tacked to the top of it, right? But I'm telling you, you're not going to build a strong structure, and it's going to be dependent on what you were doing before the storm hit. But see, a lot of times when there's no storm in our life, we sit there eating potato chips, watching TV. Right? Say, oh my, amen, oh my, oh me. Right? Or, or we're caught up in doing something, like we have our fun things that we do, and then something happens, and then we're prayer warriors. Oh, we can pray heaven down. And we're going to, and I'm not against that. I'm just saying, what were you doing when the sun was shining? Can you wake up, drink your coffee, and expect some miracles when you get to the bottom of your cup? And, it, and then you see expect miracles, and you start, you know what? I got a couple verses I need to say to myself this morning. I need to grab Jay by the ear, right? Now, you don't grab Jay by the ear. I grab Jay by the ear, okay? I grab Jay by the ear, and I begin to say some things. Jay, this is how it's going to be today. I'm going to declare and decree and I'm going to walk in the declaration that I'm saying over my life. You know what? I, I don't have a hard heart. I have a soft heart. You know, that word that the Lord said and it breaks rocks is working. It's working in me. I may have been a knucklehead, but the knuckles are leaving in Jesus' name. And the word's working. And I'm no longer going to be a knucklehead. Well, I just, you know, I went to, um, you know, uh, what's the popular thing people usually say? The school of life. And what does that mean? Well, you know, they just go to hard knocks, right? What does hard knocks mean? It means you have to learn everything. Well, I don't. I get to learn from Pastor Sidney. And, you know, if he messes up, I can take notice and say, you know what? He messed up. I'm not going to do what he did. And I'm going to learn. You can actually find, you can read your Bible and you can look at it and say, you know what? Those guys in Judges were a bunch of idiots. And I'm not going to act like them in Judges. I'm going to learn my lesson. And I'm going to walk it out. And I'm going to pay attention to words. And, and oh, well, I can't pay attention to silence very well. So I have to say something so I can incline my ear to what's being said. And then it can work in me. Because faith comes how? By Not by heard. See, this service, this service tonight is going to be heard tomorrow. It's over. Right? The only way you're going to build faith again is by hearing me preach this out again. So you have to hear it again. Now, you might make, you know, write down some amazing notes. But you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to look at those notes and you're wondering, well, why is all that scriblish stuff in there? I, you know, I don't even understand what I wrote, but oh, the, hey, you know what? We were in that chapter in that verse. I'm going to go look that up again. Oh, that's right. And I'm going to speak it. And you get to preach to yourself again. And then faith can come again. See, faith s swells up in you out of your spirit. Your spirit, man, loves to hear the Word of God. And when the word, excuse me, when the word of God is spoken, your spirit man gravitates to the word that comes up out of you, and 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 you speak out of your mouth, and it hears it, and faith rises up, and then you can be like Joyce coming up here saying, you know what, God is the God of the impossible, and something raises up inside of you, and you're like, you know what, this looks impossible, but I have a God that is over the impossible, and I'm going to stop living under my circumstances, and I'm going to start living over them. Well, how are you doing today? Well, you know, pretty good. What, what's, how, how do people usually say, you know, pretty good, you know, with the circumstances in my life, you know, pretty good. Well, how about you live above and beyond that? How about you attach your faith, and you're not dictated by your emotions? I'm telling you, you can be glad that I have worked on that in my life, that I'm not just the emotional roller coaster pastor. Good time to say amen. amen. <laughs> because I, can you imagine if you would call me and I'd be having a bit really bad time that day and I'm just a wreck? 
and, and, and it'd be the blind leading the blind. And, and, you know, you're crying and I'm crying and we both don't have faith. How many would like that? No, when you call the pastor, you're actually expecting him to be a man of faith. A man of faith doesn't go by his circumstances or by his feelings or by what's going on in his life, but he's going to speak the Word to you. That's why Pastor Sidney's meant so much to me. I, I remember a, a specific time. These things do happen in my life. I'm still working on some things, right? Haven't arrived, but I left a breakfast meeting and I was devastated. Somebody that meant a lot to me in my life had spoken some very... Uh, cruel, um, uh, faithless words into my life. And it hurt. I'm crying. I'm crying. And when pastor's crying, you know, it's kind of a big deal, right? So uh, I, I, I know I have one person I can call. I have two people. I can call Kim. But uh, at that point, I wasn't really... I, I needed a man. <laughs> Sorry, honey. <laughs> and, and And so I... Look for Pastor Sidney's number, and I call him. And, and, and immediately, I'm sure he knew as soon as he heard me, I said, speak life to me. Speak life. I didn't ask him to join my pity party. I didn't ask him, I didn't even tell him really what happened. I, mean, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't call him for him to feel sorry for me. Okay? See, all that is attention, getting attention. See, some people have to throw pity parties so that everybody comes and gives them a hug and they feel sorry and, uh, and, and that's actually a manipulation that's happening in their life and they're manipulating feelings and other people. They're getting people to have certain feelings for them. That's not faith. That's not faith. So I call Sidney and I'm not asking him to feel sorry for me. I'm not asking, is he full of compassion? Absolutely. Compassion and feeling sorry are two different things. Right? And I just, I, I'm just like, speak faith. And Sydney goes off to preaching. Best unrecorded sermon we've ever had. I'm the only one that heard it. <laughs> Maybe he heard it and he remembers it, but I know I heard it, right? And, and he goes into preaching exactly what I needed to hear and he builds me back up in faith. Let me tell you, you need a faith buddy. You need somebody that knows the difference between pity, somebody that knows the difference between pity and compassion. Those are not the same. One's from the pit of hell, and the other one's from God. And you need faith people that know the difference. You need faith people that are going to get you on the right track. And if you're wanting to have your little pity party and get all the attention to yourself, because what is it? it? It's you wanting people to know your problem and your issues. And you're going to have yourself, you're going to throw yourself a little pity party. And it started when you were two, and it never got corrected in your life. And maybe you don't remember it when you were two, but your mother and your father probably do. And, you know, at that time in your life, you would throw yourself on the ground, kicking and screaming. But now you have, you're a little more dignified, and so you won't do it that way, but you still have a way you're going to do it. And you're going to try to pull on people's empathy, right? And you're going to try to pull on, on so that they think differently of you. And you need to get to the bottom of it and say, you know what, that's not me anymore, I'm done. And you need to use your word and say, you know what, I'm not here to have pity parties, I'm here to walk in faith. I'm here because I have a man in my life that'll speak faith to me when I need it. When I'm down and when I'm out and I'm picking myself up and there's compassion that's needed, I don't need a pity party, I need somebody to speak the Word of God into my life that's going to speak the truth into my life and that will set me free. You know, it didn't take me long. Five, ten minutes of preaching. And by the time I got to my house, I was then shouting and preaching to myself because you couldn't help it because, I mean, if he's shouting and preaching, I mean, we just had ourselves a little shouting party. Ear splitting, praising God, shouting party, you know. 
just made a little joyful noise unto the Lord. I'm sure there was some off-key notes, but we made some joyful noise, it says. So it's okay to sing off-key, right? It's maybe noise, and it's okay. And it was loud, but I was by myself in my car, and it was nobody else's business, right? And I was allowed to do that, and I got myself back on, up on a place of being in faith, Amen? Because I'm listening and inclining my ear to sayings. It may have been coming out of another person's mouth, but it's healing what was going on in me because I'm willing to incline, pay attention to His words, incline my ear to His sayings. And when I do that, when I do that, I invite healing into my soul. Instead of going around and telling everybody the problem that you have in your soul, you need to tell everybody the solution to what's going on in your soul. Amen? Amen? I'm not sure if you all got that yet. Instead of going around and telling everybody the problems that you have in your soul, I understand that you may have to recognize you have a problem because if you're in denial, and it's not in Egypt, right? But if you're in denial that it's even happening in your life, you're going to have to recognize it so it can be taken care of. I get that, right? But after that, you begin to speak the solution even when you're not understanding or feeling or seeing anything different. You speak the solution to your problem because you're going to find the verse and you're going to begin to say it. You're going to begin to say it and you're going to start inclining your ear to the sayings. And when you incline your ear to that saying, it builds faith in your heart and healings happen. And you don't have to go to a conference. I'm not against conferences. How many know I'm not against conferences? I'm not against deliverance ministries. But you don't have to wait till then. You can get delivered in your car. You can get delivered in your living room. You can get delivered at church. You can get delivered in your kitchen. You can get delivered anywhere you open your heart for deliverance you can get delivered right there. You don't have to put it off. You can say, Lord, my heart's tender towards you. Yeah, but it doesn't feel very tender. I feel really hard-hearted right now. But Lord, my heart is tender towards you. My heart is tender towards you. I'm an open book. Holy Spirit, you have an invitation to come in, inspect, and take wrong motives out of me. Now be ready. Be ready. Because then the Holy Spirit shows up and then you don't want it. Because some devils you kind of want to pet for a while. You've got to get to the point where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. It's not everybody wants to be healed, Lee. I, as a pastor, I would love to help everybody. And I, my desire is to help everybody. I have compassion for people. But one thing I've found, not everybody wants a healing. They can say they want a healing. They can say they desire a healing. And they can absolutely resist every step of the way. It's like dragging a donkey through the mud. You know how they have their front feet just locked in a locked position. And I mean, I don't know how much power uh, donkeys and goats and sheep have, but you try to lead them that way, you find out they're, almost, they're stronger than you. right? And they're not willing right and 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 then you there's there's then jobs for leadership and pastors to get into intercession praying some things over them because god can change hearts we can't and you know if somebody's not willing and ready they're simply not willing and ready and you can't get them there on your own power you can't get it there the holy spirit can and he may give you the right to intercede for him, but you're not going to get it there. Get them there on your power in your way. Amen. Now let's turn to. It's eight thirty already. Uh, that was the introduction. Mark chapter four, <laughs> and we're going to close this up because I just I seen something here this last week that I hadn't seen before, and I just want to show you in closing. And uh, I believe there will be more sermons on this. Uh, I, I do believe. Mark chapter 4. I've preached on Mark chapter 4 many times. Probably one of... Well, I, don't, I would th think just offhand, it's probably a chapter I've preached more on than any other chapter. Uh, but Mark chapter 4 is about the parable of the soils. Verse 3 uh, verse 2, then he taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, verse 3, listen, 
exclamation point. So if you think the Holy Spirit says, listen, exclamation point, you think that's important? Uh, he just, you know, he got a little careless there, threw a couple marks on there, uh, didn't really mean it. Or do you think when, when the Holy Spirit says, listen, or in your old King James you might say, hearken, he means it. Does he mean it? Listen. Behold, a sower went out to sow. Okay. Now, this is where I'm going to wrap this up. I think. <laughs> a sower went to sow. What is the sower sowing? Seed. What is the seed? The Word of God. How does a sower sow? By what? Prayer, which is? Speaking. I don't know where I've been, but uh, apparently this last week I have an aha moment. The sower sows the Word. The sower goes out. How does he sow? By speaking. You cannot do this chapter without speaking. If you want the seed sowed in your life, you have got to open your mouth so that the sower can sow. See, you become the co-laborer with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, when, because it is the dead letter of the law sitting in the Bible. Oh, the Bible's so holy. It's so wonderful. It's so great. Isn't it amazing? Oh, yeah, it's so, it, you know, don't even write in it. It's so holy. It's so wonderful. Oh, yes, isn't it great? Isn't it amazing? Uh, don't, don't, you, oh, it's just, it's so precious. We have the word. We have the word. You know, it's just amazing. Oh, isn't it great? But it, that thing, that is not going to help you a lick. You can put all your, your uh, marriage vows in there. You can put your family tree in the front. You can mark it all up and write it all out, and it's not going to help you a bit. See, it's not until you decide, I'm going to sow the Word in my life. Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. Are you the sower? Are you going to sow? Are you going to sow the Word? It is the only thing that will change your life. You can look at the natural. You can look at your five senses. It's not going to change your life. And you're going to live a powerless life. You can lean to your own understanding, and you're going to live, I guarantee you, you lean to your own understanding, you will live a powerless life. That's where your understanding gets you. Peter stayed inside the boat and listened to Jesus. Got any scholars in here? Peter stayed inside the boat and was listening to Jesus, right? No. What did he do? What did he do? And he stepped out. Jesus said what? Come. Come. I mean, he's the, it was Peter's idea. He goes, if it be you, bid me come. I mean, sometimes you get yourself in trouble, right? And Jesus says, come. Well, now let's see if Peter can put his money where his mouth was. And so Peter jumped out of the boat. Now, there's 11 disciples that heard the word come, I, I would suppose. I guess you could say I'm taking liberty to the text but I would think, I, I just, just the other night, uh, Kim was on her beloved paddleboard, and uh, it was, I, I bought her a paddleboard for Christmas, and she was able to use it the other night, and she paddles out on the lake, and you know, she's talking just in a low voice, and I'm going, huh, I know, I understand why Jesus got in a boat and pushed back from the shore. I can, like, I can hear her talk, and she's like a third of the way across the lake, Right? It carries. So if Jesus is saying, come, and Peter answer, or asks the question, I don't believe the boat was that big that none of the others heard it. It wasn't, they, were out, they weren't out in the middle of, with a ship. Right? So if Peter is asking these questions, the other disciples are right there, he hears the word, come, he gets out, and the others all stood there going, I can't, uh, uh, 
up. You know, last I checked, uh, we're supposed to stay in the boat. That, that kind of keeps us from sinking, you know. Like, like in the boat keeps you from sinking. Um, trying to walk on water, I don't know, it's never been done before that I know of. And like if you get out of the, wa- out of the boat, usually you're swimming. See, that's your understanding. Right? See, your understanding knows, well, yeah, a man can swim, he can survive, he can live, right? He's not going to die, he can probably swim. Maybe even in a storm, if he's a really good swimmer, he could potentially get to the shore. But this dude's walking. Jesus says, come before Peter knows, I think maybe before he even quite knows what he did, he just kind of launches out over, and he's on his way to Jesus, walking on the water. I mean, if you want to become a water walker in life, you have got to stop leaning to your own understanding. You cannot walk in the supernatural leaning to your own understanding. You've got to get out of that boat. I know it's safe, and I know it's wonderful, and I know it has all the appearances of safe, but the last I checked, boats can also sink. Amen? Oh my or oh me. Right? Boats can also sink. Punch a hole in a boat, where are you headed? So it's maybe not as safe as you thought. Maybe your understanding is not the safe place. Maybe your understanding is just simply the furthest you've allowed God to stretch you and take you. And you have never been willing to step out of the boat. And as you step out of the boat, you're going to have to sow the Word. Now, now Peter didn't have a whole lot of time now, did he? You know, he's, I, I, I didn't hear him. Doesn't have any, we don't have any uh, um, Scripture to back up that, you know, he, he uh, stood inside the boat and confessed the Word for, for quite some time. Jesus said, come, 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 come. I'm going to say come a bunch of times, and then I'm going to step out, and I'm going to walk in faith, right? No, he just was obedient. And what you'll find out is some of the things that God has... You have to strengthen yourself and keep strengthening yourself in faith. But if you become obedient to what He's asked you to do and you step out, you know, He'll be with you. And then it says that when He took His eyes off uh, and, and He started looking around again, began to lean onto His own understanding. Now He's out there in the middle. I don't know if you've ever been in a storm in a boat. Uh, I have one time. And uh, what didn't have to walk on water to get out of it. We thought maybe we may, but uh, um, we, we, um, we, we, it was a storm, a thunderstorm, and, 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 and the boat uh, was quite unsafe, and we had everybody wearing life jackets, and we actually made it to shore. But, you know, Peter's out there, and he's walking on the water, and he begins to look. See, that's the mistake. When you step out in faith, there's going to be a challenge there's going to be the temptation that when you step out and you begin something in faith there's going to be the temptation for you to draw back okay it happens i'm not here speaking evil over you i'm just saying if jesus was tempted you get tempted so as you're walking and stepping out in faith then there is a temptation but that doesn't mean you messed up he could have said you know what jesus said come i'm keeping on walking right he could have, but he began to look, and when you're in a storm and the waves are going up and down and bobbing, I, this is just, maybe I'm taking too much liberty, but I'm just, just experiencing a storm. Uh, you're, you're in the story, right? And the bobbing of, of, of the waves and what happens when you know, waves go up and waves go down. There's like a trough, and then you're up high, and then you're down low. So what do you think happened to Jesus? See, it wasn't a perfectly smooth glass that Jesus said, come, and Peter's walking, right? So, so it's bobbing and, and, and weaving and carrying on and the, and the wind and the, and the waves are happening. And when you get, oh, go overboard on a boat, and this is just by watching, you can watch it on video, uh, a lot of times when people go overboard, there's just this weird, uncanny thing that the body, the person that goes overboard and the boat just separate. You ever notice that? So now Peter stepped out of the boat and he's walking on the water and whoosh, and all of a sudden, whoa, hey, the boat just left. And then, then he looks back. Oh, uh, I, I can't see Jesus. See, Jesus happened, you know, he's, 
He's walking on the water. He's wondering if it's him. He says, bid me come. He says, come. He steps out. Oh, well, everything's going great. I started off great in faith. This is wonderful. I'm doing something that I've never seen anybody else do. Wait till I tell my grandkids. This is amazing. And the boat left. Jesus isn't accessible yet. And suddenly I'm going, whoa, you know, it's kind of windy. You know, these waves are actually like, they're, they're kind of tall. And he begins to look at his understanding, and his understanding was, I'm a fisherman, and I know storms, and this isn't good. And usually people aren't walking on top of the water. And he begins to sink. Now, I don't know what that means, because I've laughed. I'm like, you know, I have dove into swimming pools many times, I, beginning to sink. I kind of just sink. <laughs> I mean, I don't have a chance. Uh, I could bear. I might say Jesus, and that's it. I'm done. And I'm glug 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 doing that right. So beginning to sink. I, I'm still asking the Lord what that meant. Maybe it was kind of like Jello. And and he was losing his faith, and he just sank down to his knees, and he's slow like quicksand. Maybe it's like quicksand. And he's just slowly going down. Because it had to give Jesus time to get over there, right? No, I don't know. <laughs> Jesus could be over there in an instant, but, the, but he did, and he came, and he saved him, and got him up, and they walked together back to the boat. Amen? And you know what? You might be wanting or looking. God has asked you to step out in faith. And you need to make sure that you're not leaning to your own understanding, number one. And number two, you've got to confess and sow the Word into your life so that you can complete the mission of what God has asked you to do. You have got to continually sow the Word, sow the Word, sow the Word. You know, I was so blessed here just recently. I was uh, instructed by God to give a large offering to a gentleman. It was large to me, at least. Um, and uh, I was just like, wow. And I didn't want to. <laughs> yeah, this is a different story than the $1,000. I made $1,000 look like nothing. And, but the Lord was very direct to me, so uh, um, I, I was obedient. And I was so blessed when I handed the offering to, to the man. Uh, he looked at me, he's like, hey, this is a large offering. He's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I wasn't willing right at first, but I got willing. I, how many have not been willing? But then you got willing, right? And, and he's like, look, he's like, I want to be very clear with you. If you need to build yourself up in faith over this offering before you give it to me, you make sure you spend the time speaking the word over yourself and over this before you just give it. Because he's like, I want you to receive a harvest off of this. And I don't want you to give it and give it in vain. Now that blessed me. That blessed me that he actually would have said, hang on to that offering for a couple days. Build yourself up in faith before you give it. Because how many know giving something without faith? That's why we stir you up every week to give in faith right, is so that it encourages you to use faith, right? And he, and he spoke that over me and to me, and it just blessed me. It blessed me. And I'm telling you, it showed me signs of maturity in that man. That he cared, and he seen that it was, I was, I was struggling. I was struggling to, to trust the Lord here. I mean, I've been preaching, trust the Lord. You think God holds me exempt from what I preach? Let me just clue you in. No. He does not hold pastor exempt from what he preaches. He holds him accountable to what he preaches. And if I need to trust the Lord, he will then ask me to trust him. And I will still find places where of resistance 
that I'm still not quite there, that I've got to build myself up in faith to get through. We're in this together. So if, you've been asked, if, if the Lord's asking you to step out of the boat, I've stepped out of the boat numerous times. I've left all and followed Him numerous times. Not just once, several times. I've left all. But there's a promise that comes with forsaking all and leaving all. He gets everything back to you, but it's different because now it's with the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's stand to our feet. Tonight, I hope you're, you were blessed. I hope you were challenged. It's my goal that you were stretched. Now, if you were stretched to a breaking point and you could barely handle it, uh, I will pray with you. I do have compassion for you because there's times I have felt that I was stretched to an absolute snapping point. And I'm just going to boldly say this tonight. In the last several months, some of you, and I know this by the Spirit of the Lord, I know this by the Spirit, that some of you have been stretched to the absolute max in your life and you wondered if you could handle it. And you've been tempted to think, you know, it'd probably be easier just to go to another church. Yes, it would be. I'm telling you right now, it would be easier for you to go to another church and live a faithless life. It would be. But see, God's called you here. And if He's called you here, then He thinks, God thinks, you're up to the task and that you can actually grab life by the horns <laughs> and live in faith, step out of the boat, step out of that boat, leave some things behind, leave some things behind. He is in the shattered box business. Yes. He will get you to a point where you're like, I'm not sure if I can stay, take this anymore. And He will then sew you back up with compassion and love by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and you'll look back and go, wow, I've grown. Wow, I've grown. See, we are to grow up in life. And some of you, we're pretty sure the growing up may not have been quite as fun as you may have thought it would be. And I, even, I tell my sons on a continual basis, you know, I had a son just recently, that was old enough to start coming to the youth group. And he was excited. And he thought that this was, he was ready. And then he found out that there was some requirements dad had that if you're old enough to go to the youth group, then you're old enough to leave some things behind. It's no different as adults. I have to leave things behind. There's things in the last three months I have went through some growth things that stretched me to a breaking point. It took me to my limit. But I'm already looking back saying it was so, so good for me. Because without getting stretched, I'm never going to grow. And this church, you're going to grow in this church. It would be easier in other churches you think, but you would be unfulfilled with the wrong people in the wrong place at the wrong time. But here, you're with the right people at the right place at the right time. And if God thinks you're to be here, then God believes in you that even though you were taken to a place, you may think that your character is, is being tested, okay? I mean, no, your character gets tested in this life. And you're getting to a place that your character is tested. God believes you're in the right place at the right time to grow and your character will be strengthened. And if God believes that, I believe that. If God believes that, I believe that. I'm for you. God is for you. I'm for you. And you know what? There, you're getting prepped and ready for something so much bigger that you can't even handle yet. But it's coming. And if you resist growth, 
you resist getting to those places, you'll resist, you have then, and you give in to that, you'll have the te- that temptation to do that all the time you hit that in life. And you're going to hit those places in life. And God loves you. And He has the grace available for you that you can tap into by faith. Amen? Father, we thank you for each person here and what they heard tonight. Father, I ask that you seal it in their heart with your Holy Spirit and continue to teach and guide and lead each person here to a greater depth and a greater communion with you, Lord, because fellowship is what you're after. And Father, Jesus has come back so that we can have fellowship with you, Father. Or so Jesus has died on the cross so that we can have fellowship. He took back what was stolen in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Father, that that fellowship is available to every person in this room tonight. And Father, you will continue to minister to them as they go in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We will see you Tuesday night.